So most of you know, I've been posting videos pointing out what I perceive to be flaws in the Sword and Shield games that I think are indicative of bigger problems at Game Freak and the Pokemon Company, but up until now, they've all been about things that we found out about before the games actually released, and without me having played it. In order to see if my criticisms were valid, over the past two weeks, I played through Sword and Shield until I completed everything possible to get a full sense of what the game is really all about. Full disclosure, for the first time ever when it comes to main series Pokemon games, I actually did not buy this game, but instead just played on a different account of my girlfriend's copy, which is of course one of the huge benefits of the Switch console. Now you all know I have a lot of qualms with this game, and if I were to rate it solely on my individual playstyle, or really personal wishes for a new Pokemon game and the Pokemon franchise as a whole, well, <laughs> I'm pretty sure you can get a rough idea of what I would rate it. In this review, however, I'm going to be considering the following factors in an as objective as possible manner using my experience playing through it. As if I'm a game critic who is familiar with the Pokemon franchise in other words. When reviewing any game I feel it's very important to note the context of release so we'll start off by doing just that. Now some people might argue that the context of release shouldn't be considered in a review but for instance without context we could say that Ocarina of Time was a terrible Zelda game. I mean look at the graphics compared to Breath of the Wild. In that case of course we have to consider the context of release to fairly assess the game. Similarly, if 307 game developers were worked so hard on a given game by their corporate overlords that they died during development, that would be an important factor to consider when reviewing the game. Okay, a little bit of an exaggerated example, but it does go to show that context is important. In this review, the context will not get a score in itself because it isn't in the game itself after all, but it does serve as a basic framework upon which other game area scores are judged. Now let's begin. After two consecutive titles that were largely considered to be subpar by the broad scope of Pokemon fans compared to other main series games, namely Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon and Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee, it was announced that the first new generation main series home console games in the Pokemon franchise were going to be released in late 2019. Something which Pokemon fans have been desperately waiting for for about 20 years and which has arguably been possible since then but never pursued. With other AAA Nintendo games having been recently released like Zelda Breath of the Wild and Mario Odyssey, the bar was justifiably set very high, especially given that Pokemon Sword and Shield were slated for release over two years after those two games and are coming from the most profitable media franchise of all time. Of course, in June of 2019, it was announced at E3 that many Pokemon would be missing from the games and it's since been found out that it's 52% or more than half of all Pokemon missing. According to Game Freak, this was done in the name of creating higher quality graphics and animations, having to remake all of the Pokemon models from scratch and balancing the battle system. It has since been determined by data miners that the models themselves were reused and only textures and shading updated, meaning Game Freak did lie to Pokemon fans about one of the reasons given for cutting one of the most important features in the game, the Pokemon themselves. Furthermore, a sub-team of Game Freak was confirmed to have been working on a full-scale HD Switch game called Little Town Hero simultaneously with Sword and Shield development, which, if they could make an entire game from scratch, surely they could have included the remaining Pokemon models in the new games. Yes, they have the right to work on whatever they want, but Pokemon fans have the right to be worried about how this might affect their favorite franchise, especially when there were already potential problems evident. No matter your position on these issues, I think most of us can admit at the very least that the PR and general handling of the pre-release period was quite rocky. Given all of these factors, there are high expectations for these games. What exactly is the trade-off for losing over half of all Pokemon? Was enduring buffer games like Let's Go worth it in the long wait for a home console game? And how do these games compare to past Pokemon games and other AAA Nintendo games that have recently released? With the context of release now established, let's find out what the result is. Let's first start off by looking at the pacing of these games. This is something that I did have a lot of trouble with. The game starts off quite slowly and it appears that they didn't really learn their lesson from the Gen 7 games in terms of cutscenes and tutorials. Almost every time I accomplished something in the game or finished a quest, the game would pause as Sonya, Hop, or Leon would come for an inevitable cutscene or instructions on exactly what to do and where to go next. This caused the first half of the game to be very much stop and start and interrupted the flow of the open journey we're supposed to be going on. Yes, there were some settings that could be adjusted this time to help with the cutscenes, 
cutscenes, but it's absolute in nature. You can either skip all or nothing, meaning if you do turn this feature on, you miss actual important story developments along with all the other filler cutscenes. Either way, the prompts and interruptions are still significant. No lies, there were three times I actually started to fall asleep early in the game because of this, despite generally enjoying the feel of the games at this point and being excited about the new Pokemon. I've gotten used to this with Pokemon games, but I really hope that they would have improved this substantially given the fan reception to Sun and Moon. Not quite as bad, but not a huge improvement either. The pacing of this game was also very problematic. I made sure to keep note of this. It took me 10 hours to finish the intro and get the first three badges, and then another 10 hours to get the next five badges, complete the story elements, beat the Champion's Cup, and complete the post-game quest necessary to catch the box legendary. And this is exploring every single area thoroughly and talking to and battling every single NPC in the region. The start of the game advanced way too slowly, and it's ironic because the start of the game is where the region is the most boring. It's basically just all plains and grassy fields, with the lone exceptions of Motostoke and the 10 minute trip through the Galar Mines. After the third badge, the game starts accelerating rapidly and it doesn't slow down for you to enjoy the great and diverse biomes and cities of the regions, such as the desert, tundra, mystical forests, etc., which we'll talk more about when we talk about the region itself. The pacing is also not helped by the fact that these games are incredibly easy as a whole. I went through the entire game without Dynamaxing except for the first gym battle, and after turning set mode on, only lost once to gym leader Opal. And admittedly, it was because I had nothing to counter fairies with at this point. There were a couple slightly challenging battles, such as Raihan, Leon, and Hop's final battle to some extent, but overall it's very hard to make this game difficult, especially with the inability to turn the XP share key item off. This should definitely have been optional. Overall, I give the pacing and difficulty a 4 out of 10. The Generation 8 Pokemon themselves are quite interesting. I feel like I love a lot of them, and I'm really confused by many of them as well, but this confusion has a sort of charm to it, and it's something I can't quite explain. I'll say about half of the new designs I would classify as being great, and most of the rest are good. I would have definitely liked to have seen more than 81 new Pokemon, around 100 would have been ideal, but overall I'm okay with what we got and found them to be an enjoyable part of the game's experience. New abilities and typings are a plus, and there are a lot of options given to us early on to use in-game. They also seem to have solved the frequent issue of too many Pokemon only being available or evolving way too late in the story in past games, which was a nice touch. The Gen 8 Pokemon themselves get a 7.6 out of 10. Now the story of Sword and Shield is perhaps one of its more problematic elements. To be fair, Pokemon has never really been known for its storytelling, it's more so known for its gameplay experience itself, although we have seen some great stories such as those from Gen 5. But this one I found to be particularly bad, which was disappointing given the scale that they have the ability to work with on the Switch. I've talked with a lot of people who absolutely love these games and even they tend to admit that the story was quite uneventful. Basically, when it comes down to it, we hear little glimpses and hints as to the legend of the Galar region from Sonya, which involves two heroes stopping the darkest day but aside from that, the story is absent until the very end, when suddenly Chairman Rose reveals a plan to save Galar's energy by harnessing the power of Eternatus, a Pokemon that ultimately came out of nowhere. He triggers another Darkest Day, and as we already knew happened in the past for the previous Darkest Day, Zacian and Zamazenta come to save the day again. And that's it. The exact same story was told to us by Sonya throughout the game, then the same story just merely happens again. When the story could have been used to expand upon the way too fast second half of the game, we are instead held away and kept in the dark by Leon until a bit of story emerges inconveniently right before our champion battle with him, and disappears entirely within half an hour. I do like the sort of revisionist history element of it where the history of the Galar region had been lied about and covered up in order to advance a certain narrative, and hearing bits and pieces of Sonya's investigation was kind of cool, but it was unfortunate that it was just a repeat of what was to happen this time around. The story gets a 5 out of 10 from me. The main characters of the game were fairly shallow in my opinion. Not quite as bad as X and Y, but characters like Marnie and Bede I really didn't understand the purpose of despite them being fellow gym challengers. They kind of just fulfill the same role as our rival Hop, but with differing personalities. But I guess it's nice that there was a variety of characters that could change things up every now and then. I suppose the characters do at least fulfill certain niches well enough. Leon, the unbeatable champion, Magnolia, the professor, Sonia, the curious researcher, Bede, the arrogant rival, Marnie, the... Uh, 
mysterious girl, etc., but are kind of shallow beyond that, especially in comparison to other games out there. Hop I found to be a fairly generic rival, quite annoying like Barry, but with the personality and animations of Hal. The whole overshadowed by his sibling and finding his own place in the world trope was kind of cool for character development I suppose, but I was more annoyed by him than invested in his development. The shallowness of the characters was also very evident when there appeared to be a slight historical antagonism between Sonya and Magnolia as well as between Sonya and Leon, but ultimately we never find out why, especially not with the latter two. The evil team, if you can call it that, Team Yell was evidently quite pointless and just a nuisance with no real purpose. With that being said, a lot a lot of the character designs were great, and there was definitely a great selection of gym leaders, each having their own distinct personalities. Overall, for a Pokemon game, I'll give the characters a 7 out of 10. As I said from the outset when we first saw the map, the Galar region is quite large. Not Breath of the Wild-esque, but for a Pokemon game it certainly has an impressive scale. Despite spending so much time in the plains early in the game, there are some other great terrains and cities such as the desert area, the Glimwood Tangle Forest despite being quite small, the tundra near Churchester, the massive Hammerlock Castle, etc. And the wild area's dynamic weather is great, especially for switching up the Pokemon variety. One major problem that I do have, however, is that many things in the region look massive on the outside, such as the castle, but then only have one small accessible area within, such as the main hallway. Many things look outwardly impressive, but are kind of empty shells when you actually try to explore them. Another example would be Spikemuth, which is cool conceptually as a spooky city, but literally becomes a hallway when you go through it. Winden, for instance, also looks like a massive city, but is probably smaller than Lumios or even Castelia when it comes to actual indoor areas to explore. Very few buildings are actually accessible compared to how many are visible, and the ones that are accessible are quite shallow inside. There are even some areas that are mentioned as being important places to the story by major characters, but are completely inaccessible. Overall, the exterior of the region is great, but the interiors are subpar. For a Pokemon game, I'll still give it a 7.5, but the depth is certainly lacking to go any higher than that. The post-game of the Pokemon games have always personally been the most important part for me since that's where the bulk of my playtime and enjoyment comes from. The post-game in Sword and Shield is definitely lacking and is quite disappointing overall, and I thought that this would be one of the areas that they put the most work into due to consistent fan complaints. There have been a lot of complaints about the lack of post-game in recent games after all, but alas, there is just a small story quest and the battle tower. That's about it. The post-game story quest is quite bland and super repetitive. You literally just go to every single gym consecutively to take out a Dynamax Pokemon and that's the end. The Battle Tower, as with all Battle Towers, gets pretty boring after a while, about when you reach the Master Ball tier, but it is useful for getting good items at least, and the rewards are enough incentive to at least put a few hours into it. With this being said, the lack of post-game doesn't necessarily mean there is a lack of play duration in the game and things to do after you finish the main game. The saving grace here is threefold depending on what you enjoy the wild area raids, competitive battling, and shiny hunting. The latter two have always been ways to pass time in Pokemon games after beating the story, so we can't really give credit to Sword and Shield in particular for them, but the wild area is a great addition here. Yes, it has many, many problems, but it's ultimately a place that makes completing the Pokedex more fun, allows access to many powerful Pokemon, and has raids which are quite fun to do, especially with friends, and have great rewards such as TRs, high IV Pokemon, and experience candies. The Watt system is also great for getting TRs and other rare items from the Digging Duo. One thing I will say is that the raids are too easy. Within four days of release, I could solo any raid with one competitively ready Pokemon. I was hoping that raids would be a post-game thing where four competitive players could strive to beat them together and have a real challenging time, but I'm kind of left without a challenge even as one player. I really hope that they introduce six and even seven star raids in the future with perhaps some added rewards like gold bottle caps, but this is unlikely. The post-game overall gets a six out of ten. The wild area alone saves this portion from being an absolute disaster. While competitive battling isn't unique to Sword and Shield, these games did do amazing things for it, or at least in preparation for it. Yes, over half the Pokemon are gone, and in my opinion, this centralizes the metagame hugely and deprives us of the ability to have access to a full and dynamic metagame. But at the very least, Sword and Shield made competitive battling one heck of a lot more accessible in general. 
From now being able to use mints to change Pokemon natures, getting access to the IV checker, being able to see EVs for the most part, vitamins now being able to max out EVs, egg move Pokemon being able to be found in the wild now through aura Pokemon, easier access to competitive items, etc. Sword and Shield did wonders for the ease of getting into competitive battling, which was previously a massive investment of time and resources. Online play has also improved with the ability to cooperatively do raids with friends, visit each other's camps if you're interested in that, and participate in ranked leaderboards for competitive battling, which is an amazing addition. But it's limited to 3v3 battles, which further causes centralization since there are less options to use and it gets repetitive really quickly. Furthermore, any friend versus friend 6v6 battles that you wish to have have a 20 minute timer. I don't know what the hell that's all about. The competitive metagame is still developing, but of course it's limited with only 48% of Pokemon available and 3v3 battles. I've personally noticed a lot of centralization occurring and the same Pokemon on almost every team. I wouldn't hesitate to say that this is among the most stagnant metagames I've played in and the Dynamax gimmick as a whole seems to be broken along with many Pokemon, which is terribly ironic given that one of the reasons they deleted Pokemon and Megas was for balance. There are also no battle videos, which you think Game Freak would recognize is crucial for content creators and and people who just wish to review their battles in general. The YCOM function as a whole is functional, better than Festival Plaza in my opinion, but not quite as good as the PSS from Gen 6. Online play in the wild area makes the game lag a lot currently, but whether that's Nintendo or Game Freak's fault is undetermined as of yet. The lack of GTS is deeply disappointing as well, but at least Wonder Trade was somewhat retained with the surprise trade feature. Online play in Sword and Shield overall gets a 5.5 out of 10. The framework is there, but the execution is quite bad. Thankfully, a lot of the issues seem easily fixable, but we'll just have to wait and see if they actually do fix it. The music in Sword and Shield is quite great in my opinion. There are a few mediocre songs here and there, and that wolf song absolutely annoys the hell out of me, but admittedly that just could be a personal thing, and hey, it certainly did get the eerie feel down. I found the music to be sometimes overwhelming and a bit too much for certain parts of the game, but overall it's really well done and was beautifully composed. The music usually fits the scene or area you're in very well, has some unique vibes to it, and is ultimately a positive benefit for the gameplay experience. I give the music a 9 out of 10. The graphics and animations of the games are something that I've already touched on substantially before game release and other YouTubers have covered in great detail. What I will say is there are a lot of issues with them. On the whole, the Pokemon models themselves look good with their updated textures and shading. The region itself looks great on the surface, but there are a lot of FPS issues in many areas. Despite some moves getting great updated animations like Hyper Beam, a lot of move animations are quite poorly and lazily done as well, as we've seen in pre-release. Remember that one infamous N64 tree that became a meme in pre-release? Well, it turns out that those trees are actually 99% of the trees in the entire wild area. The pop-in of various characters, trees, and Pokemon is also very distracting and takes away from the immersion of the experience. There are many times when I'm looking for a specific person such as a Watt vendor and I can't find them because they don't appear until I'm like 15 feet away from them. Going up ladders also caused the entire game to freeze elsewhere which really just takes away from the journey. This one here was made even worse when you first encounter the trainers since they throw Pokeballs up and down in the air and they freeze in the air if you get on the ladders. The characters are often in their static smiling mode in rather serious or worrying situations and their expressions often don't match what's happening in the game. I initially didn't think things like this would be too big of a deal, but it really did turn out to impact the gameplay experience. Overall, the graphics in this game are good for a Pokemon game, but there are so many issues that detract from the experience and they don't compare in the slightest to other Switch titles. There are just so many issues that could have been fixed with more time, but it definitely feels like the game was rushed. What is good is great, and what is bad is terrible. I give the graphics and animation a 4 out of 10. There is a framework for a nice looking game, but it's so horrendously unpolished and rushed that the immersion is broken quite badly. Speaking of the game being rushed, there are also numerous glitches and exploits that have been found, making it almost seem like the Gen 1 days again. From people glitching the bike into existence before the first gym, to players flying around on their bike, to overworld Pokemon glitching out and spinning in circles, to players using exploits to get unlimited G-Max raids, watts, money, experience, EVs, etc. This lack of care and attention really does cause many rare items, Pokemon, etc. to become devalued. I've also had the game crash on me twice and lost everything I had done, which has apparently been a fairly common occurrence for many players from what I've heard and is just unacceptable for a AAA developer 
game. In terms of safeguarding against glitches and exploits, this game gets a 4 out of 10, again an indication that this game might have been quite badly rushed. In terms of the overall in-game gameplay experience, I will admit that I had a bit more fun playing the game for its initial 20 hour lifespan than I expected, but the faults and lack of polish were definitely glaring nonetheless. And of course, the post-game is where my priorities personally lie, but I recognize that that's not the case for everyone. What I will say about the gameplay is that the gym challenge aspect was pretty well done, despite going by way too quickly towards the end when it was almost like we were just repeating the same task over and over again. But aside from that, it was nice that the gym challenges felt like like a big deal both in scale and in scope, and it appealed to the player's pride, especially with the fans that you develop, and the fact that the challenge as a whole is a big exciting deal, being like a major league stadium sport for the Gala region. It makes what you're doing feel significant and important, and really makes you want to become the best. I was initially worried that there wouldn't be a puzzle element to complete before gym battles, but they did in fact include them, and despite not being very challenging, they were charming and fun. Again, the wild area does extend the gameplay experience, and does switch things up for a Pokemon game which is nice. Objectively speaking, I think this game will still be fun for the majority of people playing, and it has that core Pokemon experience. It's just a matter of how long that fun will last, especially relative to other games. I give the overall in-game playthrough experience a 7 out of 10. Overall, I think Sword and Shield are personally more enjoyable than Let's Go and Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, but definitely not of the same tier as the better Pokemon games like Heart Gold and Soul Silver and Black 2 and White 2, which I think fans were expecting given that this is the long awaited home console debut. At its core, this is a Pokemon game, and it has a lot of the things that are part of the standard enjoyable Pokemon experience. For me, however, my enjoyment of the game, even as a pretty hardcore Pokemon fan, died off really hard at about 80 hours, during which I accomplished every single necessary and optional thing that this game had to offer include beating the story, beating the post game, reaching the master ball rank in the battle tower, building and battling with many competitive Pokemon, completing the Pokedex, and doing many raids and some shiny hunting. I'm sure I'll be able to put in more time shiny hunting, which again isn't a new thing to Sword and Shield, thanks to my streaming audience on Twitch that makes that a very enjoyable experience for me, and possibly some more competitive battling, but as I anticipated it has gotten immensely stale really quickly. The main thing for me is that this game had so much potential but it was largely unfulfilled and the game as a whole is unpolished and lacking many important aspects. The immense sacrifices that were made do not appear to have been made in exchange for anything in particular. The good parts that are there are often inconsistent and the bad parts are terrible. In a sense, a lot of potential is a great thing, but a finished product is not supposed to be just potential. It should have the actual substance within it. As I've said in my other videos, I believe that the flaws within these games are indicative of larger problems at Game Freak and the Pokemon Company, which are my real concern when it comes to assessing them. But in terms of the game itself, it's passable at best. It all comes down to that one step forward, two step back pattern that has been characteristic of the studio for the past couple generations. Overall, I give Pokemon Sword and Shield a 6.2 out of 10. My hope is that Game Freak will for once learn from the fan feedback. There is a lot of potential here, and by all means there was more than enough opportunity for this to be a 9 out of 10 or 10 out of 10 game, like what was done for the Mario and Zelda franchises with their recent releases. It was ultimately just unrealized in these games, which does cause concern for the future. Well, there it is, my official Pokemon Sword and Shield review. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. It was a lot of work and it was my first review, so if you enjoyed it, be sure to leave a like and subscribe with notifications on. If you did, that would be super appreciated. Don't forget to leave a comment down below letting me know what you thought of the games and what score you would give them. This has been Soul Spectre, and I'll see you guys next time for another Pokemon video.